All right, party people, what's happening? It is your boy BQ. Welcome back to the most negative channel on the planet. This is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review for May 30th, 2024. The main event of this program was Joe Hendry taking on Eddie Edwards. And I think they had an overall pretty good show. I I I enjoyed I enjoyed most of it. I thought it started off a little slow, but um when it was all said and done, I thought they put on a pretty good episode. So just to address this ahead of time, the uh, the, the backstage stuff, Artie Evans and, and Lou D'Angeli, <laughs> I've been like completely offline the last, I don't know, 48 hours. Just I just haven't gone on Twitter, looked at wrestling news. Um, and I, I've said many times I don't do dirt sheets and wrestling websites, so. I'm completely clueless of to what's going on, so I don't really have an opinion for you guys right now. I would probably, uh, you know, recommend you check out Mike Gilbert's programming, uh, Mike and JD show stuff on YouTube. He's very good about getting into the weeds and seeds of those kind of things. There's, uh, and I don't even know that I will ever give you much of an opinion on him. Like I know nothing about what they do, honestly. I know what their job titles were, but like, it's hard for me to have an opinion on. Like what Artie Evans was doing creatively, I don't know what the what would he have his hands in. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, and I don't know what Lou D'Angeli's impact really was on the company. You know, so it's very much hard for me to have an opinion on that kind of stuff. So I probably won't talk about it. But uh, it, it's like it's fucking news to me. I'm just <laughs> throwing that out to you right now. Uh, when I saw some people talking about it on Facebook, I'm like, you know, actually Mike sent me a DM kind of mentioning it and I just responded I have no idea what you're talking about and uh I don't I have none so I got no no thoughts for you guys on that but I do have thoughts on this episode of impact because I care more about what we see on television more so than a lot of the uh the backstage stuff um speaking of television I've already spoken about this about the Jordan Grace thing I think that's very very exciting um so, I mean, I already gave my thoughts on that. I'm definitely going to check out this episode of NXT to see her against one of these nameless people that they got on this uh, on that roster. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how she's you know pre- presented in the show, um, how she because I'm going to watch the whole episode. So I'm, I'm I'm curious to see how she stacks up against the rest of the roster, just how she she fits into all of that. I know she has an open challenge coming up for. Whatever freaking under no surrender siege they, they got coming up. I know she has an open challenge for that. Anything can obviously happen. Uh, but what I was told, okay, and I talked about this in my upload, and obviously this could change today, could change tomorrow, whatever. What I was told is that there's nothing on paper right now scheduled for as far as an NXT crossover to TNA. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But right now, there's no plans for that to happen. So the reason I'm I'm bringing that up again is because I just want you guys to be prepared. It, hopefully, this this open challenge happens and we get some NXT chick. Okay, hopefully that's what happens. But the history of the the TNA open challenge in the last three four years, or the 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 history of the surprise opponents, the, the surprise partner has been someone from the fucking roster. So just I mean good thing good thing is that PCO can't challenge for the knockouts championship. But I just I just want everyone to temper their expectations going into that. Again, hopefully it is someone from the the NXT roster or or someone you know someone that uh is just a, a genuine surprise. Okay? Cuz right now they're just throwing random opponents to Jordan Grace. Let's hope that's what it is, but I'm just trying to tell you guys, I was told there's no, no plans right now for anyone to come over. So just have your, your expectations tempered that um, it's Giselle Shaw or it's uh, some shit like that, okay? So um, now that that's out of the way, we can get into this episode one time for your mind. If it's your first time here, would love to have you as a subscriber. Um, give this video a thumbs up, give it a thumbs down, give it a thumbs in the middle, whatever you want to do. 
just engage helps the al algorithm, helps the channel grow. And uh, let's do this one time. So it kicked off with Ace Austin versus Chris Bay. Okay, let me let me rewind here for a second. So I know they got rid of the Ultimate Insiders. I was subscribed to the four ninety nine tier, so it did not default me to the ninety nine cent. But I went to the YouTube and membership was not an option. So I, I thought that they were supposed to keep the 99 cent tier. I don't know what's going on with that. What I did is because I have no real interest right now in TNA plus, which I guess I have no choice if I want to watch the monthly specials, but um, I subscribe to Philo or my wife does at least. So that's, we have YouTube TV and Philo. So I don't know why it, she has Philo for one particular channel, I believe. Uh, but I know access TVs on there. So that's how I watch the show this week. Um, the intro to the show, I don't know if it was the same that you guys watched, but it was like the Eric Young speech, and it showed the Motor City Machine Guns and all that. Like, I thought I was watching the wrong episode. Um, I don't know if that was like an Access TV thing for Philo specifically or or what, because it wasn't the normal, like, Tom Hannafin yelling at, yelling at us, you know, C4 Spike and a kick out. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't that shit, so... I, it, that just kind of caught me off guard. Regardless, I fast forwarded through it because I don't fucking care. Let's get into this. So, so Chris Bay um, and Ace Austin. This is the most forced breakup angle that they have done since I've watched this show. Second place was probably Eddie Edwards and PCO. You know, if you go back to the Honor No More stuff, PCO at one point was the only person in that group even freaking winning matches and because he was over with the crowd they wanted to break him off and it was very forced he didn't do anything to deserve eddie edwards questioning him it was freaking cringe as shit and this reminds me of that this is so fucking forced um this is not a story this is i, I know i used uh, eric bischoff as an example last time his terminology this is not a story. This is an excuse. You know, this is an excuse to break two wrestlers up. Now, obviously, for a breakup angle, you got to have some dissension and there's some things you got to do. But everything, everything is forced. Like nothing on screen has given us any reason to believe they can't work together. They win most of their matches. OK, they still have a contractually obligated rematch. Right, Tom? OK, they win most of their fucking matches. They have historically since they've been a tag team. They've lost one or two matches. They've had one or two singles matches for the X Division Championship. Like, there's just nothing on screen that says, hey, these guys are not getting along. And then they do a backstage interview with GM Miller or whatever, and it's like they look like they're on the same page, and then one of them gets out of pocket and says something stupid. I mean... It seems like Ace is more awesome, is more likely to get the heel turn out of the two, but um, I don't know. It's 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 just freaking stupid. I would be okay if they broke off though, and Ace was the heel and Gia joined him as a a, a valet because I think Sam Laterna they have her doing the social media stuff like she is leagues better than Gia Miller. She is leagues better than most backstage interviews. I really and on on. All honesty, I think she's better than any backstage interviewer right now. Some people might say, oh, Renee Paquette, like, I think she, she fucking sucks too. Sam Laterna is incredible, and, like, she should be on screen doing this stuff because I bring up so much about being authentic and not coming off fake, and that's that's who she is. She's perfect. So that's who I would have, and I, I would really transition Gia out of this into, like, a valet because – she is a trained wrestler. Maybe they get her to that point. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think I think that TNA fans would have a lot of interest in that if that's what happened. If if Ace broke broke off and Gia was a ballet, because that's what they do on the indies. So I think I think the fan base would have a lot of fun in that, and that would that would just make this worth it. This would that would make it interesting because if they break up and they're just two versions of ABC, no one's gonna fucking care. So if some of you guys who are older, if you remember like in the WWF, the strike force breaking up, Tito Santana and Rick Martel. Tito Santana, for the most part, kind of kept the same gimmick. 
And they did this a lot, like in the 80s and stuff. Rick Martel completely repackaged himself. Like he wasn't a version of Rick Martel from Stripe Force. He came, he became the model Rick Martel. Um, so if these guys break up, and that's that what my point is, that's it's so much more effective that way when you just can kind of completely repackage someone. So my point is if they do break these guys up, I hope that at least one of them they they flip the fucking script on us, you know? Like, don't if Ace is so like Eddie Edwards has 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 had all these different angles where you know, like when he joined Honor No More and then the system, but he comes down and it's he does this. He looks exactly the same as when he was babyface Eddie Edwards. He does the same um, mannerisms when he comes down to the ring. Like he didn't really fully repackage himself. Is my point so? In something like this, I think it's pretty inevitable, no pun intended, right, Matt Raywall, uh, that they break up. Go, do fucking, just flip it on us. You know, take take a take, take a's Austin fucking flip it on us. That's going to make it worth it for everybody because no one wants to see this. No one wants to see them, like, break up. I think they're blood or bland as a tag team, but... For the health of the company and the health of the tag team division, even if you like them or don't like them, I think the fans don't want to see another tag team split up or another tag team uh, leave or just however you want to flip it because who else is going to freaking – who's going to take their spot? Maybe they have someone in, in place, but it's it's just it, – it's very forced. It's, it's very fucking forced. I thought the match was okay. I thought it was a little slow. I just I, – I, I didn't really care. You, you know, I, I just I don't care about this, what they're doing. So it was a little hard for me to get into it, but it was OK. Like they told the story that they both know each other. So they were able to counter each other's shit. But for me, it was kind of like just slow and boring. Now, many of you probably disagree. You probably thought it was a great opener. The the finish is ultimately um, Ace Austin tries to roll him up and, and uh, uh, Chris Bay kind of reverses it, beats him. We've seen those kind of finishes before. I thought it was appropriate for this match. You know, they're still kind of teasing. They're going to keep this going. <laughs> they're going to keep it going. They're, they're, they're still teasing that, you know, Ace is, is, is going to flip it. So maybe Chris Bay is the one that ultimately goes... You know, here's Chris Bay, he wins the match. He holds up Ace's hand, and he's just got this Kool-Aid smile on, which made me think maybe Bay is going to turn. You know, I don't care who turns. Like, I, I actually really just want him to get um, to the, the conclusion of this so we can see what's going to happen. I'm in no, I'm in no, as much as I like, you know, slower stories, I'm, I just, I kind of don't care. Like, is it? All right. After this, we got Queen of the Rubber match, Zaya Brookside. In match one of three, I'm sure, versus Steph Double DeLander. So Steph DeLander comes out, and I wrote here, her theme song sounds like everybody else's. There's there's, uh, there's a certain, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. You just listen next time she comes out. There's about a third of the roster whose theme song sounds exactly like this. And I don't know what their obsession is with that, with that sound. Zia Brookside has one of the best... You know, she's top three theme songs in a company, in my opinion. Ray Wall is a heel on commentary here. So Ray Wall, to kick off the show, is, you know, these guys are brothers telling this story, and I've been there. And then he, you know, 10 minutes later is a fucking full-on heel for this match, uh, supporting Steph Delanda versus Zia Brookside. So I actually like what I saw with this match. I you know, on paper, you're kind of like, yo, this looks like it's going to be the shits. And um, I actually thought they worked very well together, given the size difference. Uh, it gives you an idea how small Zaya Brookside is, because I've told you guys before, Steph Delander is like 5'9". Like, she's not, she looks on TV like she might be six foot or something, you know what I'm saying? She's tall for a girl, but uh, she's she's the size of an average height male. So it gives you an idea idea how like small Zaya Brookside actually is. But I liked what I saw here until Steph Delander got out of the ring, 
randomly tries to pull a chair and just she just decides i need a chair for this match she knows exactly where it is pco just so happens to be holding onto the chair um tom hannafin hit us with hit, hit us with this what the hell because that's one of the things he's trying to get over and then it's it's pco i'm like oh my fucking god and then Zai Brookside rolls it up, rolls her up. So we got two roll up pins to start the show. Last week it was three of the first four matches had post match attack angles. This was the roll up episode. So um, this this whole match was just done for the post match angle with PCO, um, which I said I don't. It's bad, but it's not bad. Like it's making me shut off the TV because I. It's just a different layer to PCO, and that's just kind of what I want. You know, this fucking walking around yelling names and being unbeatable and beating people that should beat him, that gets very old to me. So at least this is just something different. So I'm, you know, I have some interest in it. So he gives her, you know, <laughs> fucking, this is, I just hate fake wrestling sometimes. Tom, Tom Hannafin, is that what I think it is? Yes, it's a handmade fucking greeting card. Yes, Tom. That's what it is. It's a heart on the front with a marker, and it says Steph in it. You nailed it, buddy. Um, but he gives her a handmade card, and then Steph uh, you know, puts it in her shirt, and she's yelling at him. Um, you know, you, you cost me the match. I don't need your help. And what I thought was weird here, like PCO is always walking around. There, there's no... Like, like he's never cut a promo on this show, right? Like he doesn't he he's, he doesn't speak English. He just yells names and walks around. He was he was talking to her. So if he can fucking speak to her in the middle of the ring, why can't he on on the microphone? Um, I I actually kind of laughed because Zai Brookside was watching on the ramp and she was just so excited, like she was pulling for this love story to happen. Because they're playing her music, and they cut it off pretty abruptly to do this angle in the ring. And Zaya just stayed there, and she's just jumping, and she's just so excited for these two. And I don't know why I thought that small detail was so funny. Um, I mean, it wasn't knee-slapping funny, but, I mean, it entertained me. So uh, then they show Jordan Grace when she showed up in NXT. And she's, re- she's wrestling some dude with a – or some girl with a dude's name. Uh, but again, I, yeah, I'm definitely interested. I said in my my reaction video, I'm not planning on going to this. I don't, dude. I don't know what it is about this last year since I've been living in Las Vegas. There is something fucking major going on every month. It seems like TNA's been here twice, um, and it, uh, fucking AW's been here several times. It's like now NXT's here. WrestleMania's coming next year. I was just like, man, this is a, a fucking lot. For a new resident, to where they're, they're also like, hey, the A's are coming, and we're going to get an NBA team. And it's it's like, it's crazy. It's it's so it's so much. It's it's not to say we didn't have a lot going on in St. Louis, because we did. Um, but th- this is fucking crazy. It's, it's just something all the time. So I'm not planning on going this. The main reason, at first I looked at the tickets. I said, okay, I might go support Jordan Grace. Why not? And then when I saw, I'm going to say the nosebleeds for the sake of argument, because this is a small arena. There's no nosebleeds. But the, like the nosebleeds, the back row was like 250 bucks a person. So if you add the taxes onto that, and my two kids want to go, and maybe my wife wants to go, like a thousand bucks for a company that I don't really care about, that's a little fucking steep for me. I can't, I cannot justify that. Because I don't care about anything else going on on the card. I don't care about any of the other wrestlers. Like, what, what am I going to watch? You fucking Ethan Page? Like, I don't fucking care. So I will just gladly watch this from home. But I'll be very excited to see what happens and um, to support Jordan Grace. After this, they have Laredo Kid standing in front of some pink lights. And he just randomly is just cutting a promo. It lasts about five seconds. First class happens to be there. Immediately, like this is why I hate these kind of interrupting promos because they're right there. First class did not uh, just happen to walk up on it. They didn't. They weren't down the hall. They were right 
fucking there. Laredo kid starts talking, knowing these guys are standing five feet away. So he starts talking a little bit. He's saying God knows what. First class runs in. That being said, I actually like this. Because I like everything that first class does. They're at least giving some opportunity for Laredo Kid to talk. I mean, the dude is the most transitional champion in the history of this fucking company. And um, at least he's not just like a, a voiceless luchador. You know, he, he's can actually speak a little bit, you know? I say a little bit because he has a heavy accent. I don't think it's like Kushida where he just, he's faking it. Like the kid, the guy knows English. Um, I kind of wish he he spoke more though, you know? It, it just would add a little something to him. I'm not saying cut these long promos and sit down with Tom Hannafin and Gia Miller and have music playing in the background, all this shit. Like that's not what I'm, I'm looking for, but just to just where he's not a mute. You know, that way we connect with them a little bit because with luchadors, it's really like Rey Mysterio is one of the, if not the only <laughs> exception to actually really, really being able to connect with somebody who has a mask on. So it helps that sometimes if they can, you know, we just know that they're not mutes is my whole fucking point. Um, so the reason I like this was because they... Well, what I didn't like is that first class was saying, okay, we watched the champions challenge. They weren't on the other team, the victorious team. They just scouted. And for that reason, they're allowed to choose which championship they're going to fight for. And they, they choose the most ins insignificant one of the, of the roster. And it's the digital media championship. Eric Young's not challenging for it. Who's on the winning side. It's not uh Joe Hendry. It is, it, it's these guys. So it's AJ Francis. But I like that they, they at least did something to justify the match to where, you know, first class just basically, or I keep saying first class, but AJ Francis basically was like, hey, I'm going to challenge for that title. And then, well, yeah, I guess Rich first class, because then Rich Swan says, well, after you go to Santino and make it official. And I guess what I liked was that Laredo kid was just like, why would I do that? Do you know how many times I've been looking for a wrestler to just say something like that instead of, okay, you want a random title match? You got it. Like he was just like, what? why of all the freaking wrestlers in this company and in every company, he was the first one to just say, why would I do that? You know what? That doesn't make any sense. Like he, he, He's trying to bring some logic to this shit. You didn't deserve a title shot. And then they attacked him and pissed him off. And you know what I'm saying? It leads to the title match next week. The Laredo Kid is the most transitional champion. I mean, if, if, there, if, there were, if there was a textbook definition of this word, like if you could go into the dictionary and and uh, look up the term transi transitional champion, you would see this motherfucker's mask right there. Now we got Mike Gilbert's favorite angle, um, Khan, walking around backstage looking for Santino. Like, does Santino not have an office? Why is he... Would Santino be hanging out in the fucking hallways? So Khan is just running around looking for Santino, and I don't even know why. I don't have a fucking clue. Did he do something on the show last week that he needs to be looking for Santino? I don't even remember. I have no clue. Maybe he did, and I forgot, but he's, he's running around. Guess what fucking happens? He bumps into Jake something. There's plenty of room to walk. There's, there's, I mean, he must have at least fucking 10 feet to his right. But he's, he's going the exact same path that Jake something is standing and talking. You can't hear their conversation, but then five minutes later or five seconds later, they're mic'd up. So, he bumps into Jake something, and he and now we have a match for fucking next week because two people are bumping into each other in the hallway. This is becoming a joke at this point that this is how they are building matches. But, 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 there is a little bit of an interesting story here because Cody Diener is the common denominator between these two guys. So I'm, I do have a little bit, bit of interest in this. Normally, you know, you tell me, hey, Jake, something's wrestling con next week. I'd be like, can you tell me what time that's on so I can start dinner? You know what I'm saying? Um, 
but I actually have a little bit of interest here. Cody Diener's a jobber, but he is the common denominator between these two from complete different freaking gimmicks. The the Diener's and the and design. I don't think he was in violent, but yeah, Khan was just in the design, not violent by design. So just complete it, just the two groups, the two teams couldn't be any different. And then Cody Diener, his current character is nothing like those guys either. So I do have a little bit of interest just to see what see what they're going to do. Um, I almost wonder, is Jake and Khan? I mean, no, nah, they wouldn't do that. That would be so dumb. I was just going to say, Jake and Khan going to attack Cody? Are they going to turn on him together? But no one wants to see Jake and Khan as a tag team. So I don't think that's what they're going to do. But there's a little bit of a story there, so I actually have some interest. Then we get Salami Calorie Ham, the bread machine, taking on Jonathan Gresham. Santino said last week that the referees will wear a mask and gloves officiating his match. So, of course, they got none other than the goof ref, Frank the Goof, to be the guy to look ridiculous with a mask and gloves on. I have a question. If the referees have to wear, because Santino is very concerned that anyone who comes in contact with Jonathan Gresham is going to get sick. If the referees have to wear gloves and a mask, why don't the wrestlers? Why don't his opponents have to wear them? Why are they wrestling him, period? Why Why is there a match? If you're concerned about an outbreak, why, why are you even having the match? Why are you not social distancing this guy? That doesn't make any sense to me. That's why this freaking ink gimmick is dumb. Jonathan Gresham's not dumb. His look is not dumb. The vignettes were not dumb. They weren't really vignettes, but they were, you know, it was video content. There's a lot of potential here. He's excellent in the ring. He looks like he's got a great physique. There's so much about him to like, to enjoy, to get excited about. But then they went a little far with this because now there's there's going to be logic holes because you're saying everyone who comes in contact with him, okay? It seems like the people who have the least amount of contact with him are the ones getting sick. You know, so the wrestlers, I mean, go back to, to COVID, you know, if you had... You could wear a mask and gloves, but if you're up in someone's shit and you're hugging, that's why we were fist bumping and shit, right? We weren't even allowed to shake each other's hands. We had to stay six feet apart from each other, and people were still getting sick. So if you wrestled Jonathan Gresham, like Kushida got sick, but Leon Slater wrestled him, and he held his throat after the match, and this motherfucker was had a title match tonight. He had no effects of it whatsoever. I was thinking, okay, we're going to give Leon Slater something to do. No. He's perfectly fine. So there's just, there's like logic holes in this that are going to continue to probably fucking bother me. But if, if the goof ref has to wrestle to wear this shit, so fuck so should fucking the, the snack machine. He should have had that shit on as well. Actually, the match shouldn't have happened, period. They should have told, John, told Jonathan Gresham, don't even show up to work. When Santino said, hey, call me, and he, Johnson. Jonathan Gresham probably didn't fucking call him back. He still was like, hey, well, you're still going to wrestle next week. Where's the continuation from that? Santino was trying to talk to the dude last week. Where's Santino this week trying to talk to Jonathan Gresham? He's in the ring now. Now you you can fucking go out there with your goofy badge and your goofy music and go out there and talk to him. But no, you don't want to because he, you don't want to get sick, but you, you're booking uh, your talent to get to, to, to wrestle him and get sick. I promise you Sammy Callahan's, Callahan's not going to be sick next week. I know he got a little bit of ink on the hand, I, I and I could be wrong. Maybe next week they got him on his deathbed, but probably he's going to be walking around yelling like he always does. Jonathan Gresham wins with the roll-up. This is the third roll-up in a row. Uh, I, I don't really count the first match, though, because it made sense within the context of the match. I, I cannot remember the last time. No, I actually do. The last time a Sunset Flip won a match, and it was Bret Hart beating the fucking Warlord in, like, 1993. Not even, the, not even that late. It was probably, like, 1989. 
know what I'm saying? Um, so the sunset flip, he rolls up Sammy. Sammy looked like a let me not body shame. It it was it was just a bad just a bad look. Um like the nicknames I have given him are, aren't already disrespectful enough, right? And then we got Gail Kim doing an interview with Giselle Shaw. So they had this these angles where Gail Kim was trying to get Giselle Shaw to come back, to come to work. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine my boss comes comes to, comes to my home's like, hey, I need you to need you to come back to work. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, so he gets Giselle, or she gets Giselle to, to come in, and they do a sit down interview with a. I'm pretty sure those are performance mics, not like podcast mics. The mic wasn't plugged in. Let's just be honest. But they do a they do a sit down in an interview style, which I I thought was a weird way to do this. I thought they should have just sat down in Gail Kim's office and had the conversation, but whatever, small, small potatoes. The backstage stuff right now, because I've been asking for this since I, I said some of the magic of the old TNA was just the way they shot the background, the backstage footage. They're, they're switching it up, which I'm, I'm happy about because I'm always talking about present wrestling different, try some different camera angles. The backstage stuff looks a little more like a Lucha Underground-ish. It looks more like a movie. It doesn't look like shit like it did before. But this camera angle where they're in the wrestler's face looks horrible. I understand they're kind of making, trying to make it look like a TV show. They're cutting different angles. I think that's great. I have no problem with that. But that angle right in their face... It is not even natural. It looks it looks terrible. It looks amateur. I don't know why they're doing that. Please please cut and do use different angles and and you know like I said it looks pretty good, but that particular part of it does not. I don't know what they're they're thinking. Um. And then they had another backstage. This is uh, Gia with the system. You know, I love my my little details, man. When Gia walked up and Alicia turns to her and says, ew, that popped me. I don't even know if you guys even caught it. It was such a such a tiny, tiny detail in the whole the whole scheme of the interview. But just that she hit her with the ew when she walked up. It popped me. Got a genuine laugh out of this guy. And, uh, you know, again, this looks good. It looks, you know, cinematic. Even um, I, you know, I they're just using HD cameras and putting HD video cards in them, and that makes a world of difference when you're recording this stuff. It's just, it's just the angle. They're right back to up in Eddie Edwards' face. I mean, up in his face, like 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 it was his cheek, and you couldn't even see his entire head in the shot. That, let me that let me reword that. Um, I don't know how to explain what I'm trying to say. It was zoomed up so close that like you couldn't see Eddie's hair or anything. I mean, it was just right up in his fucking shit. It was damn near up his nose. Like I just I don't understand what where they think the benefit is to that camera angle. But uh, she talked to the system as as they do every week, and I don't know if I was just taking a sip of my coffee and not listening. I don't know why Moose got so mad all of a sudden and had to track down Matt Hardy. I mean, he was. He was pissed, and they did not want him to leave. They were, oh, where, where are you going? You know. Um, and then Frankie Kazarian walks up, says, "What's my name?" Like, kind of like he's Joe Hendry. She says, oh, you're, "You're Frankie Kazarian." No. So now he wants her to refer to him as the King. So they're going the Elvis King gimmick rather than what I thought would have been funny is if they went for the crown and scepter, and it would have been so ridiculous but frankie kazarian as a true pro could have pulled it off you know if you're asking um man, who's 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 an example of someone else uh i don't know like let, let's just say like champagne singer like, hey i need you to do a kim king gimmick like it would be super goofy right but frankie has been around so long 
that he could pull it off as just kind of over the top, but it, but it's like he wouldn't compromise it, the integrity of his his his, um, his demeanor and the way he wrestles, and it wouldn't become a, a comedy gimmick, you know. But he's going more the Elvis King type of thing, which is which is fine too. Um, they're just having Frankie talk here and there. I would, I don't know if he's hurt or what, but it's it's almost like he's not wrestling; he's just walking around and talking to the women. Then we got uh, Steve Macklin versus Santana. This this was really really good, um, and it played out exactly what I told you. How you, I told you guys last week it was going to play out. They had the match of I don't even remember what the hell the match was at this point. But Steve Macklin came and attacked the Rascals, and Gia Miller backstage was was this retaliation? You're damn right, it was retaliation. And then Santina ha- Santino Sant- Santina Santana Santana happens to walk up right there and they have a challenge for next week and i told you guys let's just fast forward through this they're going to have a match for seven minutes and then the rascals are going to attack them and it's going to make a match for fucking whatever tna plus show was coming up the match was nine minutes exactly so it's pretty close you know i was two minutes off i didn't think they were going to go that long but the match was was pretty good, and they're, it's a very slow burn what they're doing with Steve Macklin right now where he's obviously going to be a baby face at some point, but it's not a gimmick that you can just flip on us. You know, he can't just come down, slap at hands, and smile the next week. So um, that's most likely what's going on here, the baby face turn. But the match was very good. It was a no contest, of course, because why would it be? Why would it not be? Um. And <laughs> this made me laugh. Again, these are the small details. So it has the Rascals attacking Santana and Macklin. And Tom Hannafin goes from, from his fake outrage to just immediately going, well, he didn't do anything wrong, but it shows you know he's doing his fake outrage, and then it just immediately cuts the Jody threat and Tasha steals from last week. Like it, it doesn't give us any time to take in what we just saw or to have any kind of emotion. It's just like, here's the attack. Tom Hanfriends are oh my god, and then all of a sudden, Jody Threat jobbing Natasha steals within seconds, and then it has Jody Threat slamming her hand on the wall. She's still very pissed. She is, uh, she has not blown off any steam in the last seven days, uh, but she's still very pissed about losing. Lars Fredrickson can, you know, he can talk. He's got he's got a little little promo skill to him, so he sounded good here. He's a good mouthpiece for these two because they um, are not particularly good talkers. So this kind of works. And this was an example of what I'm always saying. Even though I thought that they cut to this very abruptly, this is where you show your highlights to where it's relevant to what you're about to show us. You know, if they would have just randomly showed Jody Threat slamming the wall, they'd be like, whoa, what's what's going on here? Like, I already forgot you wrestled Tasha last week. So show us that. And they did. So I thought that was effective. They had some weird um, effects going on during this. I'm not mad at it. I just, it was just weird. It was just like out of the blue. They just have them backstage. And next week we're getting... Um, uh, Danny Luza versus Tasha Steels. And then Tasha Steels will disappear for two months. But, you know, they're, they're talking about the match next week and then they're showing these like random effects on the screen. I don't know what that's about, but again, I'm not mad at it. It's just odd. It's just odd. random is more of what I should say. Leon Slater took on Mustafa Ali here. This was, look, this Leon Slater dude. I always have to take the internet's word for it when they sign people and say how good they are. This motherfucker is so good and so talented. I just don't want him to disappear like Kevin Knight did. I know Kevin Knight is more on excursion, but Kevin Knight disappears after looking really good. Uh, Sheldon Jean disappears after showing some some pro- progress. You know, I mean, I promise. I hope this doesn't happen to Leon Slater. It looks like he's actually signed for a little bit. But he is really, really good. Really, 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 really good. 
last week, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, I, I talked about, well, AEW has Nick Wayne, and he's 18, and he's the prodigy. Leon Slater is fucking light years beyond this kid in the ring. And from the little bit we heard him talking, he's a better talker, too. He has a better look. He looks like he can actually... Like, he's tall, too. It's not like he's this little fucking, you know, little stick figure. You know, he's got a little bit of... He's thin, but, I mean, he's got a little bit of physique to him. He's got some height. He's got some size. He He's... I can't say enough good about this kid. Like, I'm, I'm really, really impressed. This is the true future of the X Division. Like, this guy can be something very special one day. And if he can really get his promos down, like, he, he could go a lot higher than that. But I'm, I'm really high on him. And then Mustafa Ali, I'm high on everything he does. If you guys remember, I've said this once or twice since, but when Steve Macklin was the world champion, I had said I would give him a security detail. I don't mean like with the rascals wearing fucking random camouflage shit and doing fake goofy salutes and standing at attention on the ringside looking like fucking idiots. Like that's not what I meant. But you get you get you know four dudes because I, I mean the, this detail of uh, Mustafalis they're independent wrestlers, right? I mean the faces change every single week. That's a hell of a payroll to just bring out new people every time. Um, what I mean for Macklin, if they had, you know, four dudes, they're kind of, you know, they're kind of jacked a little bit. They've got um, dry black dry fit shirts on and some black cargo pants and maybe even wrestle with him sometimes, kind of like Sue Young would utilize the uh, undead bridesmaids and all that. Um, that would have, I, I just think that would have enhanced his character a lot. I would I think it would have made his his um his title reign well he had a short title reign so I can't say it'd make him more memorable but I think it would have been enhanced his character at the time. And they try they, they you know they gave him Sing and they gave him Shira and it didn't fit at all. They didn't even look good together. They're using the same concept for Ali and it makes him look like a bigger deal. And the guys get involved in the match, and they don't come off like complete goofs either. But they get they get involved in the match. They've added Champagne Singh to this as Campaign Singh, and I think it's fucking hilarious. I think changing his name to that, I mean, how perfect for him that that rhymed and that you know I, I would imagine of similar descent. I'm not I'm not totally sure Ali's background. But they look good together. It fits the gimmick. They fit on screen together. And they've tried Ali with the good the, you know, the good hands, the bad hands. They tried him with the grizzled vets where they that worked. They looked really good together. But uh, they've tried to find where where do we fit Sing in? I thought even when he was in the Desi Hit Squad, he didn't fit. Like they've they've been, you know, they've been trying over the years. Where can, where can we get this guy in? Um, and this is this is a nice little spot for him. I would add Shira to it as well, but maybe that's kind of overkill because he already has bodyguards. But uh, I like this. I like this quite a bit. And this match was very, very good. Uh, obviously, Mustafa Ali won like we expected him to win, but um, I, I give this... It's worth watching the episode for this match. It was very good. Next week is the 20th anniversary. Like, I feel like every time I turn on this fucking show, it's a 20th anniversary of something. It's the anniversary of Impact, of TNA, of the YouTube, of the something. It, I just feel like we it's nonstop anniversaries with these people. The card next week looks really good. I think they have a really good show lined up next week. I didn't, I didn't um, write down the matches here that they rattled off, but I, I think it looks very interesting. The one that stood out to me was the Allison K number one contender. Allison K is wrestling for the Knockouts Championship next week, so she's just gonna—they're just gonna run through the hex. The hex is not at, at this point for us of us for for those of us who are waiting for them to like, just be signed and to stick around. They're just more random wrestlers for Jordan Grace to go through. I did message. Allison K and I said, "Hey, when I saw you, you told me you weren't going to be on TV. 
So I said, either, either you got one over on me pretty good. Because remember, I told you I genuinely did not believe that they were lying to me. So you either got one over on me or this just got booked. And she told me uh, that it just it was a, a recent a recent thing. So she said, at the time I saw you, that was this was not in the plans. This is something I just kind of came up. So I want to see them stick around. I didn't ask her directly if they are because I don't want to peel back the curtain too much because I want to, I'd rather kind of see for myself if they stick around. But I mean, they brought him in once before. They lose this tag team championship match that they should have won. And then Marty Bell loses here. Allison K is going to lose next week. We already know that Jordan Grace is going to do an open challenge. I thought Allison K was going to wrestle her at the TNA Plus show, which you see, I've already forgotten the name of the show. No surrender, maybe. Against all odds. Against all odds. That's what it is. I thought that's where Allison K was going to take her on. And I was, you know, last week I was like, okay, cool. You know, we're we're dragging out the Jordan Grace thing a little bit, but no, they're wrestling on impact next week. And we're going to get to the point where Jordan's doing open challenges. And I mean, everything this year is Steph Delander or random opponent for Jordan. She's running out of shit to do, folks. Like I don't I, for for those of you who are trying to convince yourselves that Jordan Grace is going to retire in this company, I, I I really think you have to open your minds to the possibility that that's not going to happen, because the best predictor of the future is the past, and people in her position before have left, because at some point you just have to do something else. For those of you who who follow sports or follow women's sports, most of you probably know who Caitlin Clark is. She was able to return for her fifth year to Iowa because she had a COVID year. She could have stayed if she wanted to. And granted, she never won a national championship, but it got to the point where she's like, this is not a challenge for me anymore. You know, like she's going to go back to college for her fifth year to wrestle, to wrestle, to play the same teams and opponents. And it's just like, man, at what point do you just say it's time to move on to the next challenge? So I'm very excited for what they're doing with Jordan Grace, but my personal opinion is NXT wants Jordan Grace. That They're not like, hey, I mean, we're going to see some crossover, it looks like, but I don't think they have that much interest in the TNA roster. A lot of the TNA fans are like, oh, this is a working relationship, and we're going to see this person and this person jump over. Like, Remember, Tony Khan had no interest in anyone from fucking Impact. He just wanted the good brothers. We thought... At the time, oh, we're going to see all these wonderful things. He had no interest in any of those people. And I don't know that NXT does either. NXT, I was reading Shawn Michaels was very jealous that Jordan Grace was in the Rumble. He told Triple H, like, I want to use Jordan Grace. And that's what led to this. So I don't think that, you know, Shawn Michaels is watching Impact every week. And so, okay, I want to I want to use fucking Brian Meyer. That's a horrible example. Um, I don't think they're, they're going to be like, oh, let me get Chris Bay and Ace Austin. I just I just don't see that because they have guys on their show that can wrestle like that. You know, Jordan Grace stands out. So I, I think people just have to, like, prepare themselves that, you know, I don't think Jordan is going to necessarily ask to leave early. But, you know, those, those of you who just, I know Jordan's not going anywhere. Like, she just leaked her on her, on her own that they're going to pay her six figures for three matches. Okay, money matters. Okay, she is posturing. Whether whether it's you know TNA trying to throw a big contract or, at her or whatever, like she is posturing to make a lot of money. So she is ultimately going to go to who pays her. So if TNA is just like, hey yo, we're gonna well, my Scott Hall now. Hey yo, if they're just like, yo, we're gonna give you all this money. Maybe she maybe she does stay. If they completely break the bank for her, but it's time for just people to just be like, yo, this is probably not gonna fucking happen. But I'm looking forward to her wrestling Allison Kay. Uh, and then Joe Hendry versus Eddie Edwards is the main event of this show. I don't think Joe Hendry needs to talk every single time now because he's getting closer to the top of the card. But then I'm like, well, maybe he does because I thought his promo here was very effective. I would like to see more fans put their hands up. I've noticed even when I go to the shows, it's a very small portion that's actually putting their hands up. They did the same with EC3 when that became a thing. Wave your hands. Like if it would just be, it would look so better, so much better for everyone to just participate in this shit. Even I was, and I wasn't even 
cheering for Joe Hendry in the matches that I went to. When he was wrestling uh, Rich Swan, when he's wrestling, um, yeah, he wrestled Rich Swan twice that I saw, and I don't remember who else. But I, I, I never actually cheered for Joe Hendry in these matches, but for the sake of, you know, wanted to look good, I want to get involved. I don't want to be standing on my sitting on my hands. You know, I, I put my hands up. AJ Francis called me out for that after the show. Uh, I said, yo, I'm, I'm first class all day. You know, I'm just, we're just having fun, me and the kids, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I would like to see more people in, involved with this, with, with the Joe Hendry thing. But I thought his promo was really good because he talked about, you know, his digestive system and Eddie Edwards still having a faux hawk in 2024. And now I, I've been saying this for how long now that I was like, he looks ridiculous. Now, Eddie Edwards' current hairstyle doesn't really bother me. I actually, I actually like what, he, what he's got going on. But when he had the faux hawk, the mohawk, I, I said, who the fuck wears their hair like this? When he had the cornrows going on, I don't know if they're cornrows or braids because I always get them confused. I'm not, I don't got my, my, my knowledge ain't up onto that, that kind of shit. Um, he looked ridiculous. He looked ridiculous for a long time. And now he actually doesn't look ridiculous, but. Now it's getting called out. So kind of popped for that. You know what I'm saying? This match was okay. They brought the Nemeth brothers down to even the odds. And this, you know, Matt Raywall is a heel again in this match where he, and he was a heel for Mustafa Ali as well. But then, then you got Sammy Callahan versus Gresham and he's, he's neutral for that. Get this guy out of here. Um, yeah, the sorry, I lost my place in my notes here. The match was pretty good. Um, I like, I just like matches with guys that can work, guys with size, and I thought they did a good job here. This is three straight losses. So at the end, Eddie's going for the Boston E party. Joe Hendry catches him, and that shows the strength of Joe Hendry. He he lifted the weight of the world up above his fucking head and did that slam. The, f- the finish wasn't that different than how he pinned Brian Myers, but the system has lost three matches in a row now. They went from having all this momentum. and they were, they were like unbeatable. Now they're just losing. So they went from the beginning losing two out of their first three matches, winning everything, and now they've lost three in a row. Brian Myers has been, p- been pinned twice. Eddie Edwards has been pinned once. Uh, Joe Hendry was the victor two out of those three times. So they're giving him the push that's deserved. He should be, we, we should start getting him to the top of the card. He should get a world title shot at Slammiversary. That's where I think they need to go. I would be very disappointed if if uh, they went the real white meat route and Josh Alexander comes back before Slammiversary and gets his title shot. I think the fans would turn on him, to be honest. So um, they they need to ride this wave of momentum with Joe Hendry. It sucks that the system is the one. Uh, uh, it sucks that it's at the expense of the system, is what I'm trying to say. But you know, if it, it, it's very rare that this company has organic momentum for somebody. It's not forced. They're not making excuses for matches. It's very organic. He did this himself. Let's not credit the company too much. He did it himself, but it's up to them to find a way to capitalize on it and, and to make it work. So if there's anyone I could see from the male side crossing over to NXT at this point, it would be Joe Hendry. And I've even seen NXT fans asking for that online. So we'll see if they get to that point. So I'm happy that Joe Hendry has momentum, but it's just at the expense of the system, which I don't particularly like so going into against all odds i would have thought the nemeth brothers were going to win the titles i i can't see the the eddie and and brian myers losing this much and then losing the belts too that just doesn't fit where where they're going with the system so i think eddie and brian will pull it out if they don't if the nemeth brothers win i think that's going to be a very telling sign that they're going to pull the plug on the system 
because I know some fans are blaming them for the ratings, which I don't. I think they're one of the best parts of the show, if not the best part of the show. So I don't blame them. But it's going to be interesting to see if if they lose the tag team titles here. I think that means they're pulling the plug on them sooner than later. And then we've got Moose. He's been pissed for about 45 minutes now walking around yelling. Like, if I can't find my kid or something like that, you know, I'd, 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 you're probably going to give up yelling after, like, three minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I whatever. I'll, I'll find him later. Moose is just walking around just absolutely fucking pissed. And, again, this is the camera angles right up in his face and all that. He calls out from Broken Matt, and Broken, Broken Matt is now four feet to his right all of a sudden. Like he didn't see him 10 seconds ago. And then they have a little brawl. This was done to to get the system standing tall at the end of the episode. Because they're looking like fucking goofs in the ring right now. So at least this I, I, this was just done, done, I think, to, you know, the system looks strong to, to go off the air. I was talking about some of the editing earlier. They did it again. I, I actually forgot to, to bring this up, but... After First Class attacked um, Laredo Kid, Tom Hannafin just goes, oh, my God. You know, like he's just showing his fake outrage and then right away runs into the card for next week. <laughs> I mean, it just it, – it's like such little details like that that, I mean, it just it, – it comes off so fucking fake, I swear. I guess that bothers me because – so my daughter – is a very poor active listener. When you're trying to talk to her, you can tell in her eyes, she just cannot wait for you to shut up so she can say what she has to say. Uh, and I've been trying to work with her on that since she was very young. It's probably not going to change. Um, but that's what, it, it's kind of like, that's how this comes off. So when we met Brooke Hogan once upon a time, Brooke Hogan was telling me a story about uh, one of her friends slipping at home because he's walking down the stairs in socks and he hit his head on the, the step and it killed him. And she's given me this whole story. And the minute she stops talking or the absolute second, my daughter is like, Oh, okay. Um, I like the, I like how you look in this picture right here. You know, it's eight by tens. And it was, it was so like, she's Brooke is sitting here and giving us this, like not a sob story, but kind of an emotional story about someone. And then my daughter and seconds later was like, oh, okay. Um, I like this picture right here. Just completely blows her off. So that's why this kind of stuff st uh, sticks out to me. It's where you've got this attack angle and you're supposed to have sympathy for your baby face. And then you just uh, seconds later go into the card for next week. <laughs> like shows, it shows such little fucking interest in what just happened. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff, TNA. Um, and then on the editing side too, you know, usually I talk about this at the top of the show. It looks a lot better, you know, cause the backstage stuff is kind of cinematic. I have an issue with the camera angles. The in ring is much, looks much better. It's, it's lit, you know, it's lit up much better. It's not, the show's not all dark and gloomy. They don't have the, the filter over the top of it, but this episode, they went back to the contrast settings of, take that slider and move it a little further than we need to. And now all the blacks are equal and you can't see someone, someone standing in front of the crowd and their black pants disappear because it blends into the background. They're kind of back to doing that shit again, but the show looks a lot better They're They are stepping it up finally from a production standpoint. So thank you. Thank you. Cause the show I'm so so done with the show looking like crap. You have no idea. I've been done like for like two years and I'm still still powering through and watching this shit. So good on you. Good on you. That's going to wrap it up for me. We're coming here on the hour mark. Thanks for checking me out. I am your boy, BQ. We'll talk to you next week. Peace.